Hi, I'm Jeff Davis, taking you on the wine road. To many, Zinfandel is considered America's grape. Aside from its long history in the U.S., especially in California, no one knew for sure where it came from. What was its heritage? Well, in 2001, UC Davis professor Carol Meredith, with the help of several others across the globe, solved the mystery. On a side note, you can see Carol in the new movie, Psalm, Into the Bottle. If you have any interest in wine, it's worth watching. It's as informative as it is entertaining. I loved it. Carol and I met at her home and vineyard, which sits high atop Mount Vitor in the Mayacamas Mountains, above Napa Valley. We talked well over an hour, and much of the conversation is covered in this recording, but it is broken into two sections, her research and discovery, then she talks about her vineyard and the grapes they grow for their label, Lagier Meredith, which she owns with her husband and winemaker, Steve Lagier. I started by saying, why is it, now over 14 years after your discovery, do people still think Zinfandel is related to, but not the same as Primitivo? I get that all the time, and it, it, it used to piss me off. But then I, I began to be more patient with people and realize that if, if all you read is the popular press, then it's very, very easy to get the wrong idea. But the truth is that uh, we have one grape variety that in California we call Zinfandel, and in southern Italy they call it Primitivo. And in Croatia today they call it either Cyrilina Castellansky or Pribadreg. In Albania they call it Kratosia. And I do believe there's a couple of other names. And then there are historic names, and the oldest name that we know about for this grape is Tribidrag. And so that is now considered the, the prime name. So it's all one grape. They're not cousins of each other. They're not related to each other. One is not the progenitor of the other. They're just all one grape variety, and that's not to say that there aren't any differences at all. I mean, even within a single variety like Pinot Noir, there are a lot of clonal distinctions. You can find subtypes. Sure. They're all Pinot Noir, but there are distinct, stable differences. Uh, it's the same with just about any old variety. For example, Syrah, uh, there are some really profound clonal distinctions within Syrah. But nobody would ever say, oh, well, they're not the same variety. Yes, they are. They are just slight variants within a variety. What started you on this project to identify the heritage of Zinfandel, and how long ago did you start that? Well, when I first went to UC Davis in 1980, I started soaking up uh, as much information as I could because I didn't have a background in grape. My background was plant genetics, crop plant genetics, and one of the things that I learned very early on was that Zinfandel had no European home and that Zinfandel wasn't known anywhere else in the world and that Zinfandel was considered by many to be California's own grape, mm -hmm. whereas with Pinot Noir, you look to Burgundy. For, uh, Sangiovese, you look to, to Tuscany. Riesling, you look to Germany. But Zinfandel did not have a European home. There was nowhere that California producers could look to learn more about it or to, uh, to see what, what had been done historically or even to look for new clones. And so it was assumed by many that Zinfandel was a, a native California grape because it didn't have any European home that we knew of. But anyone, and, and certainly there are native California grapes, and there are many Native American grapes, but anyone who knows anything about grapevine botany would only have to look at Zinfandel to see this is not a Native American grape because it looks like a European grape. Mm. So it was very clear to researchers that Zinfandel did come from Europe. We just didn't know where. It does have that old world flavor to it, doesn't it? Well, it certainly has a vinifera flavor. Yes, it doesn't have any of the foxy kind of flavor that you get from some American yeah. grapes. So Those it, are the Latin terms, right? That's right, yeah. So it, it certainly looked like a European grape and tasted like a European grape. 
And a number of people had, had even noticed that it had some similarities to some uh, wines from southern Italy and maybe even some wines from central Europe. So when I came along, and especially as we began to develop DNA profiling tools to answer questions about origins and relationships among wine grape varieties, that just stuck out to me as a question that I would just love to answer one day. Now, in the 70s, Austin Goheen, who was a grapevine pathologist at UC Davis, he noticed that uh, Primitivo, growing in southern Italy, uh, was very similar to Zinfandel. He was given some wine by an Italian colleague, and he, he thought it tasted like Zinfandel. And he said, can you show me these vines? And his Italian counterpart said, well, it's just the local red. It's, it's Primitivo. And when Austin looked at the vines, he said, well, you know, it looks a lot like Zinfandel. Can I take some cuttings back to Davis? Which he did. And they planted them in the UC Davis vineyard. And they compared them side by side with Zinfandel. And they looked the same. But at that time, back in the 70s, there weren't any good tools for going beyond that to, to say, yes, they look the same, but are they the same? Ah, but as technology advanced, the research was about to take its first big step forward. But would it provide the answer? I'm talking with Professor Carol Meredith about her search to find the historic lineage of the Zinfandel vine and grape. So when the DNA methods came along in the 90s, I thought this is just something I would love to do. I would just love to see if I can find the home of Zinfandel. What I did have was I had Primitivo in our vineyard at UC Davis and Zinfandel, and I compared them at the DNA level, and they, were, uh, they could not be differentiated. They had exactly the same DNA profile, which said to me that they are the same variety. Uh, I also did the same thing with a, a variety from Croatia that had been a candidate. It had been a, a suspect. And the name of that variety is uh, Plavitz Mali, right. which is the most widely grown wine grape along the Dalmatian coast of what is present-day Croatia. And so we, we did the DNA profile on Plavitz Mali. We found it's not the same as Zinfandel, although there were similarities that, based on our experience looking at relationships among other grapes, we could say, you know, Plavitz Mali is a very close relative of Zinfandel. It could be a parent of Zinfandel. It could be an offspring of Zinfandel because it shares half of Zinfandel's DNA. Hmm. So that, that pointed us in the direction of Croatia, and we weren't the first ones. I mean, it's pretty obvious when you look at a map of Italy and you look at the part of Italy where Primitivo is grown, it's, a, it's the heel of Italy, uh, and it's a region called Apulia, the coast of Apulia is the Adriatic Sea, and the Adriatic Sea is really quite narrow, and it's very, very easy for boats to go back and forth across the Adriatic to the other side, which is the Dalmatian coast, uh, and that's also an ancient wine-growing area. Today we call it Croatia, but it's, it's had other names in the past. So I wasn't the first to, to think maybe we should look in Croatia, but the tools simply hadn't been available before then. So when I decided I wanted to look there, my first problem was, well, okay, I don't know anybody there. And you can't simply, if you want to go exploring the grape varieties of another country, you really have to have some connections in that country. Maybe that country already has a collection of, of what represents their, their vineyard heritage. If they do, maybe you can get access to it, but you simply have to know people to do that. Or maybe they don't have a collection. Maybe you actually need to go stomping around in vineyards. But you have to have somebody to help you do that. You can't just get off the plane in Zagreb and go stomping around in vineyards. So I was stymied and really didn't know what I was going to do. And then uh, what happened was uh, there was a, a moment of great serendipity that happened to me in December of 1997. Uh, my, my research group at Davis had already had quite a bit of success studying uh, classic wine grape varieties, developing collaborations in Europe, finding relationships among varieties. We had found the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon. We had found 
uh, the parents of Chardonnay, the parents of Syrah. We had learned that all the grape varieties uh, that had ever been grown in northeastern France all were generally related to each other through a couple of really important um, ancient wine grapes. And we had published all this, and so we were fairly well known in the world of grapevine genetics for doing this kind of work. So what happened in December 1997 was quite serendipitous. And we'll find out what that was when I continue with Professor Carol Meredith of UC Davis about the ancient origins of Zinfandel, when On the Wine Road continues. Welcome back to On the Wine Road. I'm Jeff Davis. I'm learning from UC Davis Professor Emerita Carol Meredith about her search to discover the European lineage of the grape Zinfandel. Her initial search brought her to a dead end, but we continue as the path was about to open. So what happened in December 1997 was that I got an email from a fellow named Ivan Pejic, and he is a professor uh, of plant genetics at the University of Zagreb. And he said, Dear Dr. Meredith, uh, my colleagues and I here are very interested in learning more about our grape varieties that we have growing in our vineyards, about our heritage. Uh, we're interested in learning what we have, what their history is, how they might be related, because we think that they are in jeopardy, that with modern global economic forces, they are in danger of being lost. And we wonder, we think that your DNA methods that you have been using with some success would be very useful in our case, and we wonder if you would be willing to help us study our old grape varieties here in Croatia. And I said, are you kidding? I would just love to help you in your project if you would help me with my project, which is to find Zinfandel in its European home, which we think is Croatia. And he, of course, said, well, what is Zinfandel? Because that's not a name used anywhere else in the world except here in California. So I explained to him that Zinfandel was quite an important grape and that it was widely grown here in California, that it actually had an international market, particularly in northern Europe, and that we felt quite strongly that it probably is a Croatian grape and that in the course of studying all the varieties that he wanted to study, that we could also be addressing my project, which was to find Zinfandel in Croatia. And so this is December 1997. We immediately decided that our goals were just so, so widely overlapping and that we should work together. And six months later, I was there in, uh, in May of 1998, and so I walked into the lobby, looked for the guy who looked nervous, and he was looking for the, the woman who looked like she was looking for someone. And so we immediately spotted each other, and then we walked out to get into his car, which was a little old Eastern European car, kind of what, I don't think it was a Yugo, maybe it was a Yugo, I don't know, but you know, Croatia is part of the former Yugoslavia. It had been communist under Tito for many years, and it really, Zagreb has, a, uh, at least at that time, had a heavily post-communist look to it. A lot of gray, concrete, uh, very uniform bland. architecture, quite bland. And so we get into his little car, and he pops a cassette into his cassette player, and it's the Allman Brothers. <laughs> so that broke the ice. You know, music is such a common language. Yeah. That really broke the ice. We realized that... We, were, uh, we had a lot in common besides both being geneticists. We obviously liked some of the same music. and so You were a fan of country rock yourself? Not country rock, but blues rock, southern, oh. southern yeah. blues rock. Okay. You know. uh, and I, I just love the Allman Brothers, and I love that, that kind of blues. I'm a huge fan of Stevie Ray Vaughan, but he mm. died. And so it, uh, you know, there's a lot of his stuff around, too. And, and Ivan Page is also a fan of Stevie Ray Vaughan. So what happened from that point? Well, Ivan and I, and, and he also introduced me to his colleague, Eddie Malatic, who is another researcher at the University of Zagreb, and they were working together on this project to kind of 
catalog and understand all the old grape varieties of Croatia before they got lost. And I might add, as an aside, one of their fears was that the, the grape growers in Croatia were having a lot of economic troubles. This is a post-communist country. There were big Italian nurseries trying to convince the Croatian growers that they would do better if they ripped out their old traditional vines and planted Merlot and Chardonnay. Yeah. And this, this was a serious worry to people like my colleagues at the university who recognized they had an ancient treasure chest here and that under economic pressures, this was really at risk. And this is something every European grape-growing country has faced, and Croatia was just facing it a little bit later than some of the others. So what happened was we embarked upon our research. We spent about three years during which we would go to vineyards, and at first it was me going to the vineyards with them, but later on, because I, I couldn't travel back and forth that much, and there was really no benefit to me doing that because uh, Yvonne and Eddie could do all that. They, they would investigate, they would ask old growers, they would find old vineyards, they would take samples, they would send samples to us at UC Davis, and we would analyze the DNA of those samples and determine whether or not it was something we had ever seen before. If it was something we'd seen before, we'd tell them what it was. Yes, this is something we've seen before. Uh, if it was something we'd never seen before, then that became a new DNA profile for us, and they would tell us what it was called in Croatia. So we would add that to our database. Okay. After three years, some of those samples, they thought maybe they'd found the real deal, Zinfandel, but they turned out to be false alarms. But finally, in December of 2001, they sent us a new batch of samples, and once again, they thought maybe they really had it this time, and we were about to say, yeah, yeah, you said that before. But it was the real deal. We actually found something we had, we had seen before, but where we had seen it before was in our California vineyards because it was Zinfandel. So we actually matched a sample they sent us with something we had, which was California Zinfandel. So we had found it growing in Croatia. That's UC Davis professor Carol Meredith talking about their discovery of Zinfandel's European heritage which, until that point, was only a subject of speculation. Even today, you can hear the excitement in her voice. Imagine how they felt when they first confirmed the discovery. She continued, They ultimately found it growing in a couple of places in Croatia, going by a couple of different names. And then they also found an old, dried-up specimen in a museum, which represented varieties that had been grown in Croatia 100 years ago. And at first, uh, we couldn't get DNA out of that because it's an old dried-up specimen in a museum. It's a, a, a dried leaf. But then they found some Croatian colleagues who knew how to get DNA out of ancient specimens of all kinds, got the DNA out. That museum specimen was also Zinfandel. It was labeled tribidrag. Mm. And that then kind of unlocked the key to tribidrag. Uh, Ivan and Eddie found a Croatian historian with an interest in, in trade, ancient trade, ancient wines, got him involved. He researched the name Tribidrag, and he was able to trace it back to the 1300s, at which time it was in all kinds of trade records, land records, wills, tax records. And so it was already, by 1300, it was a prominent wine being produced on the Dalmatian coast of what we now today call Croatia, but then it was called Dalmatia, ancient wine-producing area. And so what we have concluded is that if in the early 1300s it was already prominent, it must have already been around for a while. So we don't have evidence, but we suspect that it had already been around for several centuries before we actually have the documentation from the 1300s. So that's why we now know that Tribidrag, or as we call it today, Zinfandel, is a really ancient grape variety. It was the queen of the Adriatic wine trade long before Cabernet Sauvignon was even a glint in the eye of its parents in Bordeaux. That is a noble grape. Absolutely, and uh, this is my personal campaign to get Zinfandel recognized as one of the world's noble grapes. 
it's interesting in their research and trying to discover the history of their grapes, they also were getting involved with discovering the present and future of that same variety, the Zinfandel. Yes, and that, that's a very good point in that Croatia being a post-communist country, although it has a very long heritage, a couple of thousand years of growing grapes and making wine, as old as anybody in the whole Mediterranean area, all those grapes have Slavic names, which are unpronounceable to an international wine trade that is dominated by Western European grapes with French and Italian and Portuguese and Spanish names. So Croatia has been struggling to join the global wine market. And I think the discovery that Zinfandel comes from there has opened a door for them. They now can stake their claim as the homeland of an ancient and widely recognized and very popular grape. And although Zinfandel had almost disappeared from Croatia, there were just a handful of vines left. And had we started our research five or 10 years later, it might have been completely extinct and then we never would have found it. But now there is quite a big effort to reestablish it. Uh, There are a number of winemakers in Croatia now who are very savvy people. They fully appreciate the significance of producing Zinfandel there and perhaps even calling it Zinfandel. Uh, A lot of the, the the few vines that were left were heavily virus infected, not very productive. Uh, Cuttings from those vines have been sent to UC Davis. They have been tested for virus diseases. They have been treated to eliminate the virus disease. Healthy plants have been recovered, have been sent back to Croatia. A mother block has been established overlooking the Adriatic. It's a beautiful site. And those vines, as they grow up, will become the mother vines for a new generation of Zinfandel to be grown in the homeland, but under you know better conditions, better viticultural methods, better disease control methods, better winemaking methods. So whereas it was once lost because of some disease pressures, it now can uh, experience a resurgence in its homeland, and perhaps Croatia can, can join the rest of Western Europe on the viticultural map. Well done. Thank you. Proud of the work. What a story. Even at this point, 14 years later, Zinfandel is not really considered a noble grape. But now that you've heard this story, I think you'll agree it deserves to be one. Thanks to Carol Meredith for sharing her important adventure and discovery with us. You can buy a bottle or more of Tribadrag, which is the California version, at LegereMeredith.com. That's L-A-G-I-E-R Meredith, M-E-R-E-D-I-T-H dot com. It was at this point that I had to wrap up the interview for the radio broadcast, for timing's sake. But I had quite a bit more. She shared details about their vineyard, what they used to grow, and now currently grow on their property. So I'll add that remaining 10 minutes onto this podcast if you'd like to learn more. We'll start off with her telling me about the character of their Zinfandel slash Tribadrag. Our Zinfandel, and now we've produced five vintages of it, that it's very spicy. And we find that that is really a a slight distinction that our vineyard produces a Zinfandel that is much more spicy than many other sites. And so by paying more attention to where the the Zinfandel is being grown, I think we might find that it's worthy of being called a noble grape. So maybe we should give it maybe another 10 years of people paying more attention to it, and we might find that it, it comes into that category of noble grape. Well, that list certainly seems to be growing. You'll, you know, originally, I think there were six, and now there's some say eight, some say ten. So Zinfandel can certainly be on that list. Why don't you tell our listeners where your site is located? Well, our site, we are uh, on Mount Veter, uh, which is – Mount Veter is uh, an appellation within the, the greater Napa Valley appellation. And, of course, we're not on the valley floor. We're one of the mountain appellations. Mount Veter is uh, – in the southwestern corner of Napa. Uh, it is all high elevation vineyards. It's mostly small vineyards. The The terrain is very rugged up here on Mount Veter. And even though the Appalachian is quite large in terms of the total acres that it encompasses, 
the actual number of planted vineyard acres is quite small. It's it's only around 900, and that's because most of the the area is way too steep to plant. It's mostly a heavily forested region. Here on our own uh, site, we have uh, 84 acres of property, but less than five acres of vine, and all of the rest of it is heavily wooded. We have redwoods, dug firs, several kinds of oaks, um, madrones, uh, bay trees. Now, did you choose Zinfandel to plant here because of your grand respect for the the varietal after uh, your research? Well, yes. Initially, when we came here in 86, uh, we initially decided to plant Syrah uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that We really liked Syrah. My husband, Steve Legere, and I had been enjoying uh, wines from the Northern Rhone, which are made from Syrah. We had also been enjoying a few California Syrahs, which were just starting to emerge. There wasn't much, but we really liked it. And we thought that we had a good site for Syrah. And we weren't at that time intending to, to do anything commercial. We both had our day jobs. Uh, Steve uh, worked at Robert Mondavi Winery. I worked at UC Davis and commuted from here. And we wanted to plant some vines to make some wine for ourselves. And we thought that that we would want to make Syrah because we thought that would be the highest and best use for our property. So we planted Syrah. And it was only after we made our first wine in uh, in the early 90s and poured it for some friends that we realized and were convinced by our friends that uh, that this was a, an outstanding site for Syrah and that we probably should do it commercially, and so that's what we decided to do. And then after we had been producing Syrah commercially for several years, then we thought we might like to diversify a little bit because it was getting kind of boring just producing one wine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, been there, done that, we knew what we were doing, and we were looking for some new challenges, and so that's when we then decided to uh, to grow some Mondeuse. Mondeuse is a uh, a red wine grape that is traditionally associated with the Savoie region in northeastern France. And through my research, uh, we had discovered that it's a very close relative of Syrah. But yet in France, uh, it makes a wine that's quite different from Syrah. It makes a light-bodied, light-colored wine. And we asked the question, how much of that difference that you see in the French wines is due to the place and how much is due to the grape? And that if you were to grow the two grapes, Syrah and Mondeuse, in the same place, you could then eliminate that question, and then you're asking a question just about uh, the grapes. And so that's what we did. So Doing more research there, aren't you? Exactly. We just couldn't resist. It was a little experiment. So we planted mandus here side by side with our Syrah, same site, same weather, same soil, same rootstock, same farming, same winemaking, same barrels, same everything, so that then we could compare the two, and we knew that the comparison would be between the grapes and not uh, it wouldn't be a, a comparison of all those other factors as well. And what we found surprised us because whereas in France, mandus makes a light-bodied, light-colored wine, what we got here was a wine that was even darker and more full-bodied and spicier and richer than our Syrah. So oh. it came as a shock. First we thought, you know, did did we get these wines mixed up or what? But no, it's it's proven to be the case every year. So it just shows you how much the place can influence what a grape variety can do. That is amazing considering the fact that Syrah is a pretty dark colored wine. Absolutely, and now we think that maybe it got that from, well, we don't know where it got it, because the other parent of Syrah is Dereza, which is also a, a dark grape, so we don't know which side of the family uh, Syrah got all its uh, color and spice from. And then after we had um, Mondeuse in the ground for a while, then we decided we'd diversify a little bit more, and we planted a little bit of Malbec, uh, and we planted Malbec because we had had some Malbec from other vineyards in our immediate neighborhood, and we were really impressed. I've never been a huge fan of Malbec from Argentina, but yet this Malbec that we had from other vineyards on Mount Vitor was so good. We thought, wow, there's something about Mount Vitor and Malbec. We should plant some. We would like to make wine like this too. 
And so we if got, not better. Of course, always striving to do the best that you can with, with, with the site that you have. You can never, and by the way, this is something that we firmly believe in, you can never do better than the site that you have. You know, you can, right. you can make a, a good wine from a great grape, but you can only make a great wine from a great grape if you have it on a great site. And so that's what we've always tried to find the best grapes we could for our site. And so uh, everything that we've planted has been because we thought that our site would really bring out the best in it. So we planted some Malbec uh, here, and we've been really thrilled with that. And then the, the other grape that we planted, so now we're up to four. We have Syrah, Mondeuse, Malbec, and the fourth grape that we planted was Zinfandel. And that is because we were looking for another red grape, and it suddenly occurred to me, duh, yeah. I've done all this work with Zinfandel. You know, really, I really should have some Zinfandel of my own so that I can connect my dots and so that my scientific life and my commercial wine producer life would not be completely separated so that I wouldn't be such a schizophrenic. Maybe I could link those two and maybe by growing Zinfandel here that would bring me that would make that connection for me. And so Well how interesting too that you know the history of the the grape and it's such an ancient variety. I would think that you'd want to have that right here. Well absolutely and, and of course it was only after we planted it. When we first planted it, we were intending to call it Zinfandel. And, you know, when you first plant a grape, you're not, you're not putting the label on a bottle for, for several years. Right. And so it was only after we'd been growing it for a while and had even made some wine and it was still in barrel, and we were starting to think about the bottling of the wine, that it suddenly came to me, we have got to call this Tribidrag. And I remember at one point telling a few people that I wanted to call it Tribidrag. And at this time, I had actually applied to the TTB for the label, but we had not yet gotten label approval. And so I said, well, I do want to call it Tribidrag, but please don't tell anybody. And at the table were several wine writers. And I realized, oh, my God, you know. I just told everybody. I just told everybody. And I said, please, you know, please don't spoil my secret. Until I get this label approved, I'd really like to keep this quiet. And so they said, well, okay, but let us know the moment it gets approved. And so the day that it got approved, I told all the people who'd been at that lunch. And, uh, and so that, that, the cat was out of the bag then. Well, Carol, I can't thank you enough for your time and uh, sharing your wine with me. And I want to know, you know, I brought some cash with me. What would it take for you know, to, me to buy the rest of this bottle? You know, what I would rather do is give you an unopened bottle because we have a friend coming for dinner, and we were planning on finishing that with him. Okay. So I'll give you a full one to open at your leisure, okay? Uh, I'll accept that. Okay. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I, I love having the opportunity to tell the story both of some of the research I've done, but also of my life here on our property and how kind of unexpectedly they did come to converge mm -hmm. when we decided to plant Zinfandel here and call it Tribidrag. At some point in the future, Carol and her husband Steve hope to build a winery on their property on Mount Veter. Keep an eye on their website for eventual details, LagierMeredith.com. I'm Jeff Davis, and I hope you enjoyed this podcast of On the Wine Road. <laughs>